five. Hello, everyone. My name Hello. is Steve Berman, and I am the owner and publisher of Lethe Press. And this is a Tyler convention virtual <laughs> panel. This is Tyler. He is our official sponsor, and he has gen genuously, generously provided uh, kibbles for each of my guests today. <laughs> and we are also brought to you by uh, Oh yeah. Shanbo Gunpowder oh, yeah. Irish Gin. My reason I bought this was because it was blue. So, Very good, Jan. Uh, we're all having cocktails here, and I would like my esteemed panelists to introduce themselves as I pour. <laughs> Gentlemen? Jeff, why don't you go first? Okay. So I'm Jeff Mann. I have published some historical fiction. I've got two, and Steve has published most of this. I've got two um, novels that have to do with the American Civil War. Why don't you and say then, the names of the novels? Oh, the novels are Purgatory and Salvation. And I also have been publishing historical fiction about Viking Age. Uh, this is now out of print on the run. Um, there's a novella in here set in the Viking Age that I'm hoping Steve will republish since I have the rights back. And I am hoping this summer to start a trilogy of novels based on the Viking Age. Ooh. There you go. Patrick? So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Horrigan. And um, <laughs> I have published uh, two books with Lethe Press. Um, the most recent is uh, this novel called Pennsylvania Station. And uh, this is a novel about um, a sort of May-December romance between uh, a young activist and uh, a middle-aged architect set in the early 60s against the backdrop of civil rights and the uh, effort to save New York's old Penn Station from demolition. Um, and I, I also published a novel in 2015 with Lethe Press called um, Portraits at an Exhibition. I don't have that right in front of me here, but um, that takes place in various times and places throughout history. It's about a guy in an art museum looking at paintings. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here. That's good. Hey, I'm Scott Alexander Hess. And Jeff, I like your horn that yeah. you're drinking from. I we think had a dollar. We all should have someone, horns. Someone said that they liked his horn. I like that. So I've done three novels with Lethe Press. Two are historical fiction, and one is a little spicier. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. First was The Butcher's Sons, set in the 30s in New York City's Hell's Kitchen. Uh, three brothers living in a butcher shop and a bunch of stuff that happens and um, always LGBTQ characters. And then lately, The River Runs Red, which is set in St. Louis in 1891. Uh, three, four, no, no, there's four different first person points of view that lead the story. Um, so those are my two big historicals. And then I'm writing some historical, uh, just finished a novella and um, working on a book set in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, uh, so. I, I would uh, like to say that my panelists are very modest because they didn't mention their numerous acclaims. Jeff has won, is it one or two Lambda Literary Awards? Yeah. Two. Uh, Patrick is, has won uh, Virginia Museum of the Fine Arts. Right, I remember that. And in fact, it has a he has a medal. I was hoping that he would wear his, his gold <laughs> ring. And and Scott has been a finalist for uh, the Lambda Literary Award also. Um, and in <laughs> fact, uh, uh, both Jeff and Scott have written some uh, acclaimed uh, erotica as well. So right. uh, we're we're very we're very talented bunch here. Uh, and I'm just a humble host. So uh, oh. today, today at our Tyler Khan panel, this is on <laughs> gay historical 
fiction, and we'll touch also on gay historical romance a bit because all of you have have romance uh, pretty actually important uh, to your books, even though I wouldn't arguably say that they're romance novels. So, so our first question that Tyler would like me to pose to you all <laughs> is, what is the allure of writing in the past? Um, what does it offer you that telling a contemporary story does not? So, um, feel free to, to chime in. I went first last time, y'all hit it. Huh. Well, I'll, I love the past because, uh, I mean, it, for gay characters, it offers so much more conflict when I wrote about a 16 year old falling in love with a boxer in the thirties in Hell's Kitchen. And then there's a heat wave and they're in a butcher shop and there's no, you know, they bring the meat in, in ice packs. And so I, uh, when I go into different periods, I love that it offers me as a writer, so many inherent, um, uh, you know, conflicts and obstacles and, and around living. Um, and I love learning about other times. Plus, my gay characters have a lot more issues. You know, the, the love affair in 1891, um, the love affair I wrote in 1930. Um, there's just so much more. It makes it so much more exciting to write. The richness, uh, their own passions, how they make love, you know, all that kind of stuff. It gives me so much to work with. So... That attracts me along with settings and just all that stuff I find fascinating. So uh, something, something you said, Scott, um, resonated with me about um, enjoying learning about the past. And, you know, I think maybe partly because of my, my academic background, I'm so used to researching my way into things that I write. Um, and I came relatively late to writing fiction, so my, my training was writing nonfiction. Mm. Um, and I think, I think one of the things that attracts me to writing about the past is not, not only that I just get to learn stuff that I'm curious about, but also the past, I guess this is true of anything that you have to research, but I feel like if I'm if I'm setting a story in the past, it's gonna it's gonna set all kinds of um, limits for me, which I which I need as a writer. Um, for example, in in Penn Station, I decided that the the story was going to take place between two rather famous protests, one in 1962, one in 1965. And as soon as I made that decision, so many other decisions got made. And it, it, it suddenly, like a lot of things came into focus in terms of like the story I was trying to tell. And I feel like that happens a lot when, when writing about the past for me. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, that all makes sense to me. I, <clears throat> when I first read that question, I was flummoxed. I, I had no answers. And about half an hour ago, I thought maybe I ought to figure this out. <laughs> so I don't look like a complete fool uh, with a horn in his hand. So. Uh, <laughs> I think that part of it for me started with the fact that growing up in a little town in West Virginia, which was fraught enough, as you might imagine, once I realized I was gay, uh, a lot of the fiction that I found that had positive, well, I had there were two kinds of fiction. There was fiction, contemporary fiction set in cities that I had problems relating to because I'd never been to those places. And once I got to those places, I thought, two or three days, nice, and then I'm back to the mountains. <laughs> so I had problems with those novels. But the other set of novels were by Mary Renault, who wrote those historical novels set in ancient Greece, when same-sex attraction was not so fraught. And so I, was, I found in the past positive role models of being gay. Uh, another thing that I, attracts me about the past is I figured out a long time ago, the reason I don't like science fiction is because it's almost always set in some urban 
not always, but often set in some city. There are these huge cities with flying taxis and so on. And I'm, again, I'm a rural guy. And so to, to study the past, there's less technology, there's fewer people, there's a closeness to nature, the living in the natural world, which I find appealing both as a small town guy and a pagan. So those are some of the reasons I think that historical writing has appealed to me. I, I think it is all very interesting. Um, most people probably know of the press through its um, queer speculative fiction, works of the fantastical and the strange. Um, mm -hmm. But, and well, part of writing speculative fiction um, is world building and defining your world. And I suppose, as Patrick has sort of mentioned, when you're writing historical fiction, you actually also have to limit yourself and define the time period. And I know that, I mean, all of you have written in, in different time periods um, and were constrained because obviously um, there were no telephones, say, in the Civil War, <laughs> and there was no um, uh, grinder in, in, you know, in 1950s, 60s. And I mean, I, I, I don't mean to be really flippant, actually, because that um, by defining what time period you set the rules of the world, and unless you're writing anachronistic fiction, uh, which really none of you do, you're all pretty darn true to the time period. You know, it puts limits on not just plot, but character. Or would you, um, I mean, if you have further thoughts on this, please feel free to jump in. Well, that's very true. And I'd just like to echo her earlier statement, which is that if you said it in the past, Scott, I think, said this, there's just more conflict when it comes to same sex, whatever. I mean, it's hard enough now, I gather there's assholes on Central Park who don't want to let homosexuals into their medical tents, which is no surprise to me at all, because I've grown up in an area where fundamentalist Christians have hated me and, my, and mine. But um, the Civil War, there is, I, I did so much research on the Civil War, and there's almost no evidence of any kind of same-sex same relationships. And that's probably because the soldiers left their letters and the families read the letters and went, oh, no, no, snip, 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 or better still, you know, burn them up. Uh, so for two men to be attracted to one another in 1860, whatever, and then to admit it, Right. One another and then to do something about it. That's so much more fraught than anything that any of us have experienced, I would imagine. So and that, I'd imagine we've experienced a lot of fraught. <laughs> so that lends me or leads me, excuse me. Boy, one glass of gin. Um <laughs> anyway, so that leads me to Tyler's second question. Um being a gay storyteller, you are all conscious of the many issues that gay men face, even in the best of times, coming out, uh, homophobia, heterosexism, isolation, body image issues, finding safe spaces. Uh, these could be almost uh, insurmountable in the past. Um, how do you feel, uh, how, how did you feel writing about these elements uh, and yet um, trying to tell the story that you wanted? In other words, did you feel an enormous amount of pressure hampered? Did you just say, you know, I'm chucking all these past rules out the window? Tyler and I both want to hear your your thoughts. I've sort of responded to some of that, so you all yeah, You know, I, a lot of, I've had so many ideas since everybody's been talking, and um, 
like the rural, uh, attractive to the rural versus the city. Um, but also, you know, my development as a writer, I grew up in Missouri and until I, I just never really thought I would have sex or I had no role models. I think it was Rip Torn on TV. <laughs> I, I, there was a Gordon Merrick novel, yes. but I thought you had to be beautiful and blonde and super wealthy. So I never yeah. thought I'd have sex. I never thought I'd write about it. And you um, turned out beautiful, but, blonde and wealthy. Look at that. <laughs> it's like a dream come true. But it, but I discovered people like Jean Genet yeah. who were like be writing, because uh, I, I then it took me a long time to discover too that you could write beautiful literary, gorgeous prose and it could be really sexual and sexy and like Alan Hollinghurst, Jean Genet. So I discovered them later and I'm like, oh my God, he's having sex in prison in, I don't know, 1900. Um, and then Hollinghurst writes about different periods. So first I discovered that People were writing about men having sex in different time periods. And then also it could be beautifully written. So uh, those were all discoveries that got me to the point of just realizing I could write stories about um, rich gay characters and use beautiful language. And then jumping around in time and realizing that when I researched River Runs Red, 1891, uh, Lewis Sullivan, the more I researched, there were all these rumors that he was gay. Um, and I jumped on that. Um, I wanted a gay character, but I didn't know it would be Lewis Sullivan until uh, I started finding more and more things out. And it was very subtle. And he wrote this weird little novel. And, and, and I, it was harder you know, to unearth that. And there were also articles about kind of an early transgender um, community that lived in St. Louis and like they, they got arrested in a hotel or something. Um, so that, I kind of circled all around that, but those were all elements that led me back to how interesting gay fiction could be. Um, Scott, I want to ask you something along those lines. Do you, are you are you are you saying that, or do you feel that, in order to write, you know, rich characters in beautiful language, as you as you said, mm -hmm. that that setting setting the story, setting you know, having those people be in the past, does that lend itself to that more? Is that, no, are you, are you not that? necessarily. No, the first hurdle was that I had to discover writers of literary fiction that had strong, exciting gay characters and wrote a hot sex scene, like Ellen <laughs> Hollinghurst. Um, and then it got broader because I'm like, oh, and you could even set something in 1890, and men were having sex on the riverfront. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. because I lived in St. Louis. So, um, so it, that those are two separate kind of things. But one, yeah. first I had to acknowledge that I had a choice beyond Gordon Merrick. Like I could have a, a great love story, uh, LGBTQ, great sex and literary writing. That was like the first hurdle. And then the second hurdle was, and you could find out about what they did in these different time periods, mm -hmm. you know. It's like it gives writers that you, writers that you read and admire give you permission, really, to. Right. You think, oh, well, they did that, so maybe I can too. And that's. Right. That can be a real revelation. I, I remember discovering that a poet I admired from West Virginia was a lesbian. And I was in college and I thought, you can be gay or lesbian and be from West Virginia and write about West Virginia and write about, there's a cat here screeching, I'm sorry. It's a lady chai, Mr. Steve. <laughs> so at any rate, yeah, I got you, permission, yeah. Go away now. Well, I tell us to, I'm interested how you did do your research on the Civil War, gay men 
falling in love? Well, that sort of hops ahead to some of the other questions, but, um, hmm. well, you know they're there. It's not like, you know, Gilgamesh was having fun with Enkidu and Babylon, and then from 1861 to 1865, men weren't, you know, getting it on. Uh, you knew they were there. So, hmm. I don't know exactly what brought me to the Civil War, except that I've grown up in places where battles have occurred. And I had an ancestor who was a Confederate artilleryman. And I've gotten into arguments with people all my life about the Civil War because I'm a Southerner and I'm proud of my Confederate ancestry and people have shit frenzies of outrage over that. And I, my last uh, book of essays has an essay about that because otherwise I'm a flaming liberal. Uh, so I'm very much aware of the Civil War and its presence on this, the landscapes that I've lived in. And so that probably started the interest. So, and um, it, was just a matter of, it was just a matter of reading, 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 because as you all know, if you publish a historical novel and you get a little detail wrong, there's going to be some, I'm trying not to cuss. Concerned reader, some concerned <laughs> readers. Yes. But, okay, before we get into research, I just want to give Patrick um, a chance uh, because, I mean, both your, everyone's novel does deal with some um, concern of homophobia. That is just, that is, I mean, that is a constant in, in modern gay life and definitely same sex relationships throughout much of history um, have also dealt with the specter of, of homophobia. Um, I think that um, Patrick's book deals with it a little differently than than uh, Jeff or uh, Scott's because I, I feel like internalized homophobia is uh, so very present in Patrick's, like that is a, that is a bugaboo. I don't wanna be spoiling things, but I think that it's a really rich mind to tap. And so just some of the, the issues that face gay men, I thought, Patrick, if you wanna discuss that. Yeah, actually, the, the 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 thing that it just occurred to me as you as you mentioned that Steve was um, a novel that I admire a lot, which is um, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. yeah. and that was that was one of the models that I had sort of dream models in my head when I was writing Pennsylvania Station. But one of the things that that always strikes me about Giovanni's Room is that you know the narrator is this um, bisexual but probably more gay than by a um, guy named David. Um, and there's no evidence in the novel of, of hostility directed toward David or any of the other gay characters in the novel. The, 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 the phobia and the hostility exists internally and, mm -hmm. and among gay men, it's sort of like, hatred of, of effeminate gay men, that kind of thing. Um, and when I was writing Pennsylvania Station, I, I found, I, I realized at a certain point that th there was no incident of, almost no incident of, of homophobia being directed toward the protagonist. I mean, little, little things said here and there that show insensitivity or ignorance, mm -hmm. but nothing, nothing spectacular. Um, you know, that, that appeals to me just because I'm very drawn to psychological fiction and psychology in general. And I'm, you know, Virginia, you know, some of the writers that, that Scott and Jeff have, have mentioned, including Jean Genet and um, Mary Renault, like for me, the writer that, that formed so much of the way I think about fiction is Virginia Woolf. And um, so, you know, I really love tunneling into uh, a, a character's psyche. Um, and and I, I guess 
when you're when you're seeing the world that that you're you're building in the past from from within the mind of a character who lives in that past there's a lot about the past that past that that person is going to be taking for granted so it's not going to be thought or it's not going to be seen because it's it's just assumed and i don't know that that raises sort of interesting questions in my mind about when you're depicting the past in that way what needs to be what what needs to be shown what needs to be registered so that the reader understands oh we're in 1962 or oh we're in you know 1890 because um, it's being seen from the perspective of a person who's totally immersed in that world it's not being seen like a reporter flying back into the past that's, that's an excellent point i i I do think that um, you have to ask yourself sometimes, um, and th this will lead into Tyler's next question, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, can we tell a historical tale and file off the serial numbers, not give exact dates, um, and still sort of, what are we conveying? Other than we, you know, on the one hand, do we want the reader to be a tourist or do we want to assume that the reader is a native? Um, because that is the characters are all natives. And so how immersive can, can, can the author be? Can, you know, is, is the author a tour guide or trying to think of an analogous other term for someone who, you know, is, is present in the moment. I mean, is, it, is the author a tour guide or a hostess? I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or a bod in the case of Jeff Mann. A, a bod, yes. Well, <clears throat> panderous, that's another story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, I'm not sure of the answers to any of that, but I am thinking about a novelist whose name I will not mention, an uh, Appalachian novelist I deeply dislike because she insulted a friend of mine, <clears throat> and therefore I'm delighted to tell you that, <clears throat> email me later, I'll tell you who it is. Um, when I read her novels, when I read her novels, I don't read them any longer, there would be chunks of material that it was clear to me was research material that she had discovered that she just felt compelled to put in the novel, even though it didn't, it didn't really belong there. Mm. So in that respect, she was being a tour guide. I would read it and go, well, that's interesting, but this is, to borrow a metaphor from a composition textbook I used probably 20 years ago, it's like a snake that swallowed a golf ball, mm -hmm. right? there'd be this chunk of undigested information that was interesting that she had obviously gone to some trouble to discover, but it was superfluous, really. It was external to what was going on. So that may be related to something of what you're saying. So Tyler's third question for the panel is, research is the key to world building the past. Can you tell us a couple of methods that you find worked best for you and please tell us why sort of um some of the goal of this is there could be some viewers of of our of tyler khan who um want to write historical fiction or want to um develop further skills and so if you could be mindful of of suggestions and sharing your experiences I, can I say one thing about that last question? Sure, of course. Because that stirred me up. Um, <laughs> if I, I think, if I understood it. Um, I, I just think about the humanity of the characters. Um, that, you know, my straight brothers from Missouri, um, mid, older straight women, I like when they relate to my gay characters are the internal psychological struggle of their 
It could be their homophobia or their fear or their anxiety or how difficult it is to get through a day or to make to have a love affair. Or, and when I have um, people not at all aware of that world, but then relating to it on a humanity front of like, I understand, I loved when that kid struggled with that boxer he was having that secret affair and he thought they were going to be killed because I had a fight with my husband who so I think that's kind of related that um, I hope um, anybody who reads my books and the characters conflicts are more human so that anybody can relate and also as you posed it I realized I always give violence there's always violence like the internal homophobia turns into like two of my characters literally get in a fight over the villain who's trying to ruin them. And then my brothers, the the one brother who finds out the other, well, he catches them making love. Um, he literally beats them to a pulp. So I always do bring the anger of misunderstanding and inability to grapple with, you know, maybe uh, their own inner home homophobia that they can't handle like a dear brother's realizing the person's gay so they beat him up you know I, so I, that I, 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 I will say well, for readers uh potential readers too of scott's work that he does delve into often um the potential for violence between also partners too in some ways that i mean in your in your um finalist for erotica you you have a dangerous relationship it's different it's dangerous different from you know uh, some other writers you you always have the the questionable almost the 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 demon lover aspect of you know you know this 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 is um you know rough trade taken a bit too far you you do have a penchant for rough trade. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or at least an artistic penchant. How about that? Yeah. All right. So let's let's talk about yeah. some research. I I will say this. I love reading nonfiction about historical things. You know, I take great delight in learning that margarine at one point was uh, <laughs> tinted tinted pink, you know, very very gay, very right? tinted pink because they didn't want people to think it was butter. And those are the kind of historical facts that are utterly useless, but I love, so. <laughs> That'd be an undigested golf ball, I think, Steve. <laughs> well, well I, I, you know, I, the, the funny thing is that Jeff mentioned that, but most of the stuff that he's written in historical, there aren't, there is no golf yet, so. <laughs> oh God, no, I don't know I mean, anything. I suppose that, that, um, that it could be a serpent that that chokes on what is it a minier bullet that are the round oh yeah a mini, yeah a mini yeah right a mini bullet right yeah, I have one on the back the shelf back here <laughs> I'm sure you do so, anyway, um, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that that question about research um one one thing I I enjoyed doing when I was writing Pennsylvania Station and I, and I'm doing it right now for a, a novel that I'm writing which is set in the 1980s. Um, I enjoy reading fiction written in that period, in the period that the novel is set in, um, as well as, you know, historical works about the period. But the, I feel like the fiction and film, uh, but especially the fiction written during the period that my novel is set in, is going to give me directions as far as like the horizon of possibility in terms of thought and, and language. So for when I was researching Pennsylvania Station, I was reading all kinds of fiction from the 50s and 60s. And I was, you know, I'm a, I, I, I underline all the time when I read. And, but I, I, I was underlining the weirdest stuff. I was underlining these off expressions and, you know, vocabulary, um, or like in the novel that I'm writing now, which is set in the 80s, I was reading American Psycho and I, I was reminded that um, the bank, which is now um, Chase, Ch Scott, help me with this. Is it, what's, what is it that we see all over the city? Chase? Chase? Chase, Chase Bank? City bank? Chase Bank, yeah. Yeah, not Citibank, Chase. Used to be Chase. Chemical Bank. And mm -hmm. it was chemical in the mid 80s, 
Mm. When I moved to New York and when my novel, my current novel project takes place. So, you know, things like that, I would, I would circle that. And, mm -hmm. and, and that for me, you know, that might be enough in a certain passage just to kind of, you know, call up the whole era. Um, so th that's one thing I would recommend is read, read fiction from the time that your fiction is set in. Um, and, and other media that exists from that period. Mm, that's smart. That's and, smart. And also just one, one thing I'll add to that is, personally, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by pastiche. So for example, Pennsylvania Station, I wanted it to, to feel like a novel that actually was written in the early 60s. Um, and so again, I, I wanted to make sure that the language was it had that flavor. So you create a sense of verisimilitude through um, careful study of, of period fiction and yeah. writing. Yeah. And you know, and I mean, the, the question is though is, is um, I mean, an early, a, an easy mistake a writer of historical fiction could do is including so much language that is, mm. you know, period sensitive mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that people don't recognize it or the, you know, you, you, you overindulge and right. so yeah. it becomes a slog for readers. I mean, you have to balance that, you know, on the, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, certainly some pieces, you know, 1960s is more accessible than 1860s. Mm -hmm. So I know that Jeff ha is cautious in using some turns of phrases that that people would be use, but I mean, I remember, uh, I remember writing that story for you about Jack the Ripper, which was was it 1888? I think so. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want to indulge too much in that, but I did find a website of Victorian vulgarities. Right. Hmm. And I just had to put some of that in there. Right. There's, there's a parrot that exists in one of those pubs in London, the old Cheshire Cheese. It's stuffed now, but in 1888, it was a lot. It's not stuffed. <laughs> it is stuffed. And it, uh, it's in a cage and it's stuffed and it's Polly the parrot and she was known for her vulgarities. So I had to have a scene where we hear Polly. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I um, go ahead, Scott. I, um, I use art too. I read and also will go look at artists. Like when I discovered, um, is it Singer Sargent? Mm -hmm. You guys know John Singer Sargent? Yeah, but infamous, and, and I, infamous closeted. I, yeah, right. People don't know. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I try to think about how that person is thinking and feeling almost like an actor in that time period and then write as if I'm that person with those restrictions or those desires or to keep it more grounded. Um, and the other thing I do, I, I find that if I really let research um, lead me down all these different roads, like, I had to figure out how gay men secretly had sex in 1930, New York City. And it took a long time, but I eventually found the wharfs. Um, and it, I mean, I like to make it as non-clunky in humanity and, and realism and all that by taking what I know is factual. Like there were some sort of reports and things about on the riverfront in Brooklyn and, and hustlers and sailors and and take it and make sure I anchor it in truth, but then run with it with the characters I create. Um, and then use things like films, artwork, books, um, like the alienist I looked at or, um, but then have fun with the truth in my characters and being like, oh, okay, it's this year and I'm a hustler on the riverfront. Like, what would that really be like, you know? Um, so 
I use all those things. That leads me to, to um, Tyler's last question. Um, and that is, you have all included romance and actually sex. It depends on how well described. I mean, some more than others or more detailed. <laughs> um, other than the security of being able to openly court other men and maintain a relationship, is there anything about the time period you wrote in? And for those of you who have picked, you know, have written multiples, just pick one, please. That made gay romance so very different than how we experience it today. And that could also be for gay sex, because let's face it, there was no anal douching probably back in, you know, when you guys wrote. So maybe, well, maybe Patrick. Patrick may have, may, Patrick may be on the forefront of anal douching, but. <laughs> Discovering <laughs> how universal it is. <laughs> I mean, unless they're using like, you know, sheep splatters for you know, <laughs> some way. And I, by the way, I am very tipsy at this point. So go ahead. Uh, <laughs> that's good, Jan. We have two bottles back here. <laughs> I'm shocked that you have two bottles of anything left in your house at this moment. We hit the liquor store today. All right. Yeah. Um, well, I, so the Viking thing. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, what is gay gay romance and gay sex for? Yeah. So, I mean, I do the I do some of the research you all are talking about in terms of I'm I read Icelandic sagas, which mm -hmm. were written. I mean, I'm teaching a course in it this semester, so it's it's dovetailing so beautifully with what I'm writing poems based on the Nordic runes. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to try to start the first novel of this trilogy. So it's really handy to be teaching all this material this semester. I read and this. And you look the part, by the way, at this point. Right. <laughs> yeah, I kind of got that in Iceland. It was very flattering. Uh, and I'm we just noticing Iceland. your braid, by the way, Jeff. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but nice. Yeah, that, that, that is his, his usual come on. It's like, would you like to see my oh, yeah. braid? <laughs> this is the mating dance, right, of the Vikings. <laughs> right. Uh, I can't braid anything, but luckily I am around people who can. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Vikings. So I'm reading this Icelandic literature, which was written maybe 200 years after the Viking Age. And one of the major, most of these Viking sagas are about blood feuds. And slander will cause somebody to run amok and kill somebody and then their relatives need to kill. It goes back and forth, back and forth. It's like Hatfields and McCoys, so I can relate. And um, one of the biggest slanders was to suggest that a man took the passive position in homosexual sex. So there's this hyster it's hysterical in one respect, in other respects, the beginning of the end. The most famous Icelandic saga is called Njal Saga. And there's been this back and forth, back and forth killing. And finally, they're about to come to some kind of reconciliation. And they've gathered all this money to pay to this man so he'll stop killing. And one of the characters who's insulted says, you are the sweetheart of the troll of Svenafell who uses you every ninth night as a woman. Well, I laughed out loud. <laughs> we were in Svenafell and I was joking about my boyfriend, the Svenafell troll. I couldn't find him. Here I was. But in the sagas, that causes a, a sunder that leads to one of the most horrible events in all of Icelandic literature. So for me to write about two Viking men and one of them a sooner or later is gonna bottom. I mean, people bottom shame these days i was about to say bottom shaming brought to you by several hundreds of years of literature. exactly <laughs> exactly so for for me to have a character my protagonist is eventually going to be is going to start out as a bottom so mm -hmm. the shame issues that he's going to have to deal with and to get through because of this cultural bullshit i mean that's going to be some psychology that's why but yeah. thankfully, he has the sweet, sweet love of another Viking. So, here, here. All right, who's next? 
Well, that sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, I'm I mean, tell you. Scott, there, 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 there will be, I'm sure like, that there will be someone tied up. So yes, you, I mean. I, mean, <laughs> I, I think, I just, I, I, as you spoke, because I, I mean, Vikings, it's one of my fantasies. So, um, but I thought, I'm glad you're going to write the scenes because I could see it written and someone would just, ignore all that and layer some sort of sex scene in and it would not be so exciting because we wouldn't what you just described that history that shame that that real that reality of back then and yet they have sex so thank god you're writing it which also sometimes when people say like i don't know anybody can write anything but you have to have been through it as a gay person to understand the depth of that shame to then write those scenes. Um, so I'm glad you're writing the Viking thing. You know, it's like, um, and I forgot what the question was, but I'm so <laughs> caught up in the Vikings. What was it? Oh. About like writing gay romance and sex in your time oh, right. period. How is it, how is it like so different from yeah. nowadays? I mean, that's what I think Tyler was asking, but at this point- <laughs> I think, is... I mean, my, my main thing was just to figure out how they got away with it like also psycho psychologically how deceived they were internally like in river runs red that calhoun he's a hustler but he also falls in love and you know to try to think about things how uh internally conflicted is he lying to himself even how does he allow love to come through and then also just the geography of like how secret do they have to be and, and uh, you know, how do they get away with it, basically? Um, yeah. That those things I grapple with. So there's the emotional, psychological, but then the, there's also just the realism of, do they have to rent a hotel, uh, you know, or what do they do? Where do they go? Where do they hide to actually have the sex? Which always, always fascinates me too. So like in a different time period, did they, duck behind an alley did they you know it's like so the those those are all parts of it when i think of it too all right patrick come on let's let's go so i i just picking up on something scott said a while ago about john singer Sargent, the the painter late 19th right. early 20th century so in my novel portraits at an exhibition there's a, a chapter that revolves around the Sargent portrait and I, I did a, a fair amount of research on Sargent in order to write that chapter. And part of the chapter is, is written from his point of view. Oh. And I, there's more coming out about him as we speak. Um, uh, there was a, an exhibition, I think at the, at the Gardner Museum in Boston. Um, actually, it, it, it would have been happening now, but for the pandemic. Um, about uh, a, a, a guy who was a model for, for Sargent for a lot mm -hmm. of his paintings, including paintings of women. And it was a black guy, he was a, a, an elevator operator. And so the, oh, the whole exhibition is about this, this guy and, and what we know about him and, and his relationship to Sargent. So when, when, I was, when I was writing my chapter on Sargent in Portraits at an Exhibition, the, the painting that he's making in that chapter is a is a portrait of a of a woman and her and her ten year old son, but I, I I sort of throw something in at the end of the chapter where he's thinking how how relieved he will be once he gets this session over with because we we know that he he had gotten sort of tired of painting portraits tired of painting high society people he actually didn't like children even though he was a great painter of children. Mm. Um, and um, he had this manservant named N Nicola. And I have him think something like, you know, tonight I, I, you know, I'm gonna sketch him as Christ on the cross or something like that. And it's almost like, does Sargent understand that he's gay? <laughs> well, and, and, and so that, that's a sort of fascinating thing for me when I think about certain periods in the, in the past. I mean, let's face it. Gay as a construct is postmodern, post World War II. Before that, same sex desire. I mean, I, I remember reading 
um, a nonfiction piece that discussed the nature in the Pacific Northwest of same-sex dynamics, and they suggested that um, oral sex was the primary um, release for the well-to-do um, uh, people that actually would probably define themselves as close to queer as we would, whereas the people that were in a really homo male homosocial mini society, such as the loggers in the Pacific Northwest, their dalliances were primarily anal. They would be, um, again, they would have the bottom shaming. They were, they were referred to as wolves and lambs where the young yeah. boys at the logging yeah. camps would Lally. serve as their lambs. Oof. And there was, you know, it was not a reciprocal sort of situation. And so that was a very, very telling about how people both see mm. sex and relationships. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, I, I think that one, we're all, we, as as we would all state, we all love gay historical fiction because we love to explore the different time periods and all the pressures that the time periods, whether they be warfare between the states and feelings of betrayal to your kin and country, whether it be um, uh, poor families dealing with generational issues and brother uh, secretly betraying his brothers because that he is homosexual, or in your case, the, the just the blossoming of you know LGBT sort of activism, mm -hmm. and and you know um, just a few years can change how one person sees. You know, I should be. You know, I yes, I'm. I like men, but I want to keep in the closet and keep quiet over it rather than a young lover saying, no, we want to fight for our rights. I mean, these are elements of all your books. And I think it's very fascinating that we, we get to live these lives. Um, certainly Tyler loves it for that. So <laughs> as you can tell by the tone of my voice, I am really tipsy at this point. So I will ask for... Final remarks from each of you, and then I'll close it out as I have another sip. <laughs> well, my only remarks are that I really enjoyed this. I have, I rarely get a chance to talk to other writers. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty isolated here. Uh, I'm normally isolated, so the present pandemic for an introvert and someone who really likes to cook. <laughs> exactly. I'm, you know, I'm, Not so I'm different. Not, uh, <laughs> But I usually go to Saints and Sinners. I would have been at Saints and Sinners, I don't know, this past weekend or whatever. Um, so it's nice to be able to have this kind of camaraderie and not have to pay all that money to go to New Orleans. <laughs> Tyler does not charge any money for Tyler. <laughs> so. um, anyone else? Comments? Yeah, um, I, I agree. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Jeff and Scott. This was really, really great. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this and fun. Um, uh, just, I want to throw in one, one thing about a book that I'm currently teaching and a course on, on literary representations of music and musicians. I'm teaching the novel, mm. The Mambo Kings Play Songs of Love by mm. Oscar Iguelos. And, um, one of the, I'm struggling with it. I, I like. I ultimately, I, I I've decided I like it, and I think it's, you know, it's impressive in a lot of ways. But I think it, for me, it it's a little overstuffed with historical detail, mm -hmm. and this this conversation sort of helped click in my mind some of my reservations with with this book, but. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and I was surprised by my my feeling about the book when I got to the end, because it moved me at a moment and in a way that I really was not expecting. Mm -hmm. uh, I was genuinely moved. And, and it was by the main character who I found really not likable for mm -hmm. most of the 400 pages. But I guess 
this makes me think about things Scott was saying about the truth of the character has to somehow emerge amidst all the historical window dressing. And if that truth isn't there, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work. And I guess what's striking about this novel for me, Mambo Kings, is that in spite of the fact that it's like overdressed historically with all that detail, that there is truth in that character and it did hit me in the end. And so for me, that's, a, that's, a, that's when art works, if I'm feeling moved. Yeah, for sure. That's all I wanna say. <laughs> Now I'll echo. Thank you, Steve and Tyler. And uh, it's been great, Jeff and Patrick. Um, it just stirred me up a lot and gave me so many ideas. It is great to see other uh, writers to connect with you guys, especially that write similar things, to hear like minds. It gave me a thousand ideas. I'm hoping I'll remember them in the morning. <laughs> but um, it, it's it's great. I need more of that because you forget, you'd sit there and write and write and write and you forget, you know, you just, it gets isolating. Yeah. Um, and also, the who's going to write the logger book? I mean, I guess oh, you're yeah. coming out with that, Steve, because that sounds like a good one. So I'll I'll read that that. One. <laughs> I read that one. I have, I have, uh, someone's got to write that logger book now that you've I've always wrote wanted it. to do either the logger book or hobos, to tell you the truth. Because oh. again, hobos were another issue. Um, I mean, it's fascinating how much of American history is just limited. There are these these small enclaves of of just men. I mean, mm -hmm. the loggers definitely, you know, definitely mining camps, um, and um, that. I one of my favorite research books is a book called Pirates. Um, I believe it. You know, I am really tipsy. So this <laughs> pirates and uh, sodomy, sodomy and the pirate tradition, which is the notion yeah. that nice. if you are in a situation where there are no women around, um, much like many prisons today are segregated. So mm -hmm. sailing vessels were segregated, and other is uh, instances you would have. You would have men that were doing sex um, and they wouldn't necessarily, they wouldn't be what we considered gay, but some of them could very well. After all, 10% of the population. So, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of someone being woken by that experience. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, but I want to thank uh, our, our host, Tyler, is... He got him to some catnip, so he's off the scene. Um, yes, I, I'm hoping he's, yeah, we have to talk him down so, from the window ledge. Um, so I want to thank Jeff, Patrick, Scott. You've been great in our inaugural panel right. on gay historical fiction. Um, I probably won't remember anything, so I will have to re rewind this. Um, all their books are available on Amazon, um, also lethepressbooks.com. You can also go to Book Moon, uh, which is my new favorite bookstore in East Hampton, Massachusetts, and you can order their books there. Um, and if you, uh, when I share this, I will include little mention of everyone's name so people can track them down and you can be stalked, so hopefully right. happily stalked. Um, thank you all for this. Thank it's you, been Steve. Terrific. And let's all wave to the camera and uh, say goodbye. Bye. Be careful. Take care. <laughs>